This is Colonia Cast, episode 24. You can find us at the turtleroom.org slash Colonia Cast. Today we're joined by John Sejagat, who is the executive director of the Zoological Association of America. John was also the past curator of Australian exhibits at the National Aquarium, uh, where he's worked. He's got a lot of experience working with turtles and also some other animals uh, and has done some really incredible sort of field work and, and has some, I think, great stories. So we're excited to talk to you today. John, thanks for coming on. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Thank you for being here, John. Um, this question is something that we ask, uh, you know, everybody just to get into a conversation. So what first got you interested in turtles or animal conservation in general? So I, a little bit about myself, I started my career in Trinidad, where I was born, Trinidad and Tobago. I worked there at the National Zoo, which is the Emperor Valley Zoo run by the government. And um, I, I, I was a small mammal person with a great interest and passion for anteaters, uh, unknown to me that there were only four species to work with. So I quickly became familiar with that and sort of got bored and um, then decided to go into reptiles. And so at a very early age, you know, around the, my early, early 20s, 22 or so, I started working with reptiles. And with reptile, working at the zoo, being a member of the Trinidad and Tobago Field Naturalist Club, I got involved in conservation. And then I got my first big lead into um, reptile, especially turtle conservation, when I started working with um, Porognemus Expanser. That's interesting. I didn't realize that you had done work with uh, the Podoc Nemus. That's uh, when it comes to the sort of the Australian exhibits. Uh, that did you transition into that kind of later on, or uh, yeah, it, that became a necessity out of the job. But I started with Podoc Nemus expanser when I, I joined the Emperor Valley Zoo in nineteen eighty one, and we had a collection of seven. Product Nimitz Expansers, which was 74 years old that we can record, um, having been in captivity for 74 years old. We, they were all pretty much mature when they come in, so we don't know what age they came into captivity. And I started working with that, and I became the first person to have ever bred Product Nimitz Expanser in captivity. And I did that in 1987 and bred 37 offsprings, which I then sent to the Bronx, South Car uh, uh, Riverbank Zoo in South Carolina, and several other places in the United States who were interested in Product Nimitz Expanser at the time. So most of these animals that you see around um, in the New York zoological facilities, South Carolina, um, all of them came from the breedings that I did in 1987. Okay, so yeah, this was prior to your work at the National Aquarium. That, that's yeah, pretty long before. That was long before. I wasn't even thinking about moving to the States yet. I only moved to the United States in 1990. Okay, all right. Huh. Well, that, that's interesting. I've seen, uh, I think... Ah, uh, geez, at the, uh, the the zoo in Chicago, I forget the aquarium in Chicago. They have Podoc Nemus erythrocephala. I can't recall if they have an expanse, but they might at the uh, yeah the names. Yeah, yeah, there are there are there are, there are, there are few in captivity. You have erythrocephala, you have uh, expansa unifilis, and lately I have seen a couple um, uh, vogelai gone into into the um, zoological industry. I've seen some of the some of the expanse at the Bronx Zoo. So, mm -hmm. yeah, but I started my total work with Peter Pritchard in that um, when I was trying to breed them, I did everything in the book, and nothing happened for quite a number of years. I started in '82 trying to breed these guys, and nothing happened. And then in '86, um, Peter Pritchard, who was working on his book, The Turtles of South America, um, I had known Peter for quite a while. He came down to Trinidad and said, well, listen, I am going down into Guyana. You can go down with me. We're going to take a look at the environment and then you can make assumptions and come back and try to see what you can do with your colony of expansers. And when I went down there, we went in the dry season and um, lo and behold, I realized that the water these animals were in were very, was very deep and it was cool. Although it was in the dry season, my interpretation of the dry season from the tropics was very shallow water, very hot water. 
but um, that was not the case. It switches during season. I found that the Potocnemus expanser were leaving the river in the rainy season, going into the flooded forest. The water was very shallow and very, very warm. And at that time, they were mainly eating vegetable matter, fruit, fallen fruit, leaves, buds, that kind of thing. And as the water receded in the dry season and went back to the river, the water was very deep and cool and they were eating carrion. Uh, mainly dead fish and dead animals they could find. So immediately when I got back, I got into a new enclosure, uh, deeper water, switched things around. In the rainy season, we put them into very shallow water and feed them on the fruits. And in the rainy, dry season, we put them into deep water, maybe about a meter and a half, and the water was really cool. And immediately like that, the animals bred by just switching those factors. So field excursions, really going into the natural habitat, see what the animals do in its natural environment does pay off. And for me, it was a big bonanza where I got 37 babies. And subsequently from that, we've had numerous um, uh, lanes and hatchings, successful hatchings and lanes from that same group of animals. Mind you, right now, they're over 100 years old. <laughs> wow, that's... Uh, so. Wait, so they've been in captivity for, you said, 74 years in the 80s. So, yeah, they're... Yeah, so they're wow. still alive. They're still at the zoo in Trinidad. I see them every time I go down there. I go down there a couple of times a year, two to three times. I still work with the zoo, and they're still there. Right now, we have to separate the males from females because we have bred so many, and there is no area to put them back out. And since these animals came into captivity in the early 50s, um we have no idea where they came from they were just brought in off a boat that was used they were boats were keeping them for food brought them into trinidad dropped them into um a, a pond at one of the big hotels and that's where we got the the zoo got them in 1958 when the zoo opened the zoo got them in 1958 so we can't we don't have any way of knowing where they came from so there is no um uh plans to repatriate or do anything like that so we have to stop breeding right now well, that's pretty interesting. We're uh, we're actually at the Turtle Conservancy as we speak, working with uh, the Colonial Research Institute collection and cataloging things and such. So, talking about Dr. Pritchard is, I, I think, pretty interesting. Obviously, anyone listening is going to know who he is. But that that must have been a really interesting adventure. Did you find any other turtles when you were in Guyana, or was it specifically looking at uh, just the podoc? No, we do. Peter was looking at location for, in that time, the big thing was these, this color morph called the cherry head um, uh, carbon area. And we were driving through all the different areas of um, uh, Guyana, looking at habitat and looking at where these cherry heads occur and what kind of way their ranges are. And while he was doing that, I was interested in platycephala uh, Platymus platycephala and Podocnemus expansa. So we made a couple of side trips, went out a couple of some of the islands in the Demerara River, um, looking at platycephala and things like that. So so I was sort of uh, a jack of all trades. I was into snakes, looking for snakes, for the zoo, looking for turtles. And uh, at the same time, if we can um, see anything with people who had Podocnemus, zoos that kept Podocnemus down there, um, I looked at that and then we went out into the... Um, uh, central Guyana Shield region to look at um, colonies of uh, Potocnemus. That's that's a really interesting biogeographical region. The the, the Shield. I seem to recall a lot of sort of endemic species there, and kind of an interesting, I guess, tectonic history. Kind of this the, the that area how it sort of come to be. Um, so. That, that's really interesting that you started sort of working with with those and then but you so you switched over to the National Aquarium I'm presumably when you moved in 1990 to the United States was that or and then kind of switched into working with Australian species predominantly or were you working with other turtles as well no I when I moved to the United States I started working with bats um, I was the director of the Luby Foundation in Gainesville Florida and then after that, in the year 2000, I started working with the National Aquarium. When they, they, they first contacted me about doing um, a bat exhibit about, uh, as part of that big expansion, that big $85 million expansion called uh, Wild Extremes. And while working with them there, 
Um, I got involved in the, the, the list of fishes they would like to work with and the other species. And um, at the time, they were trying to finish up the exhibit design, the collection plan, and the narrative for the exhibit. So I got into that, and then I'm like, well, what the heck, I'm already involved to that extent. I might as well take the job. So I took the job. Um, I moved on from being a director of a facility to work as a... And so then in, uh, uh, I started consulting with the National Aquarium. I decided to take the job as the curator because it offered a lot of good opportunities. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do was everybody was watering down the exhibits in the United States from Australia to Australasia because there was no Australian animals available. And I decided, no, we're going to be as authentic as I could because I knew some people in Australia. And I decided that we are going to have a very authentic Australian collect collection. So I joined the National Aquarium in 2003 and put the animal collection together and then decided, OK, now I'm going to go out and get those animals and bring them back. And um, it, that had not been done in the last 30 years. And it took a long while, but I finally got all my permits met with the government officials and started a massive collecting trip to bring fish and reptiles, uh, uh, mainly turtles and lizards, back to the United States to um, meet the demands of this exhibit. So you brought, you were like responsible for bringing most of those Australian animals back for the National Aquarium, not just the turtles, like everything all, else. All, everything. All the, everything in the Australian exhibit was my responsibility, all the fish. You know, I was shipping fish, almost uh, 3,500 fish came out of Australia, um, uh, uh, close to 300 turtles came out, you know, 19 species of turtles came out of Australia, um, lots of lizards, and then selecting and finding birds that were authentic to the Australian region that we were trying to depict. That's, that's, that's uh, got to be sort of a kind of a crazy process to, to get all of that back into the States. How did you get the permitting for that? Was that, what was Well, it? the permitting was a big challenge in that Australia does not give out permits. Although their laws said that you can apply for permits, they really don't give it to you. And um, yet they denied me the permit twice when I applied for my permit to bring in uh, lizards and uh, turtles. And um, after the second denial, I bought an airline ticket on a laptop and I went out to Australia and I went to the uh, office and um, applied for the permit and they denied it. And I made the corrections and I give it back to them that same day and they denied it again. And I stayed right there and corrected it and handed it back to them before I left for the evening and was back there early next morning at eight o'clock. And more or less, they're like, OK, here is your damn permit. Go get what you need to get. <laughs> yeah, I guess if you're persistent, it sort of works. Yeah. Well, I, I met all the requirements and um, they have very, very stringent rules and regulations, which I understand from in being in Australia, you need those rules and regulations. But for being in, in a city, in an aquarium in Baltimore, we don't have to worry about bushfires and drought and and, you know, uh, predatory animals and all that kind of thing. We are inside a building. So it was kind of difficult to get them to understand that. And then when I also brought crocodiles in. And when you're looking at the crocodiles, they had their crocodile as the amount of space needed for one crocodile. And by the time you get the, you know, eight crocodiles I was going to bring in, I needed uh, uh, an enclosure the size of uh, a football field. And so we had to show them that, you know, those were not practical here in the United States because we don't have the problems they have. And so it took a while to, to explain to that and get buy-in from the Australian um, Department of Wildlife to be able to make the compromise and eventually give me the, uh, the permit. That's interesting. What were, so when it came to sort of logistically how you planned kind of that, that, that those expeditions or, I would imagine multiple expeditions. What what were the first turtles or species that you kind of sought out as kind of your first baseline to get? We had a big list of the chelodinas from the northern region, and we had all the shortnecks from the northern region. We were focusing on the northern part of Australia. The exhibit really focused on Animland and the escarpment region. So we wanted everything from the escarpment. And um, we also 
cherry pick some of the things that had big, that were charismatic, had a lot of storytelling, some color coloration and color and stuff, things like the big expanses, uh, you know, so we, we sort those things out. And um, we, we, we consulted with John Ken, the guy who wrote the turtles, Fre Freshwater Turtles of Australia, um, to let us know, you know, location, seasons, times, best times for collecting and that. And then uh, a colleague of mine from the aquarium, Jack Hover and myself, and myself set out there for uh, about uh, six to between six and eight weeks to go out to Australia and do some um, uh, collecting. Jack had done a sortie before where he went and looked at the environment and look at the logistics of collecting. He had done that before I got there. So we got into Australia and got a lot of turtle traps and stuff and bait and um, then decided to take our list, uh, permit list and go out and just sample the rivers and see what we were getting. And we worked in partnership with the Territorial Wildlife Park. And at the time there, the curator was Dion Wed. Dion worked with us, providing us logistics with boat, transport, um, some traps and storage area for these turtles because we couldn't catch and ship. We had to wait till we had a good enough collection to make it worthwhile to go to the airlines and ship back to Baltimore. Everything that you had and you put in a box to ship to Baltimore, it took 52 hours from Darwin, Australia to um, BWI in Baltimore. So we got, we got the Department of Wildlife, we got the consultancy of John Ken, and we got the Territorial Wildlife Park and the service of Dion Wed to help us to make this thing a success. And it was a lot of work, a lot of nighttime sampling, going out at night, you know, braving crocodile infested waters and stuff to find the species that we were looking after. That's, uh, that is pretty, that, that's got to be some, some crazy sort of stories from that. Is there anything... I mean, is there anything in particular that stands out as one one of your more interesting experiences while there? Or? Well, there, there was a lot in that uh, where we were in Northern Territory, we were around the Daly River, Victoria River, extending all the way into the Kimberleys. And that's big crocodile area. And, you know, yeah. um, we were we were catching turtles one night. We went out to, to find some... Um, uh, in those days, they were called Chalodina rugosa. Now they're in the Oblonga complex. And we went out to get uh, uh, rugosas. And how you get them, they're in these big log snags and you have to bump them with the boat. And when you bump it, they swim out. And then you either jump in the water and catch them or you dip net them and get them out. And um, the river is pretty big. And the first question I asked was, hey, Dion, are there any salty saltwater crocodiles in this area? And he said, no. I've not seen any out here. So we started catching turtles. We are jumping in, we are catching. And then next morning I got up and on the opposite bank of where our tent was, was a big 12 foot saltwater crocodile. And I'm like, Dion, I asked, he said, no, I told you I hadn't seen any out here. I didn't tell you there were none. I just told you I hadn't seen any. <laughs> so, so there are lots of stories like that of, of near misses and encounters and stuff. But, you know, at the end of the day, the challenge was limited time and trying to get the species that you were after. And, um, you know, these animals were so encouraging. They were so beautiful. There was so much physical traits and features about them that we had not known before that it making all the more interesting that everyone you caught, you wanted to really examine that animal and see what it looked like, see what was different, you know. In some of in, in our collecting, we didn't take all the perfect animals. We took some animals that were, you know, missing ha a big chunk of its shell from a crocodile bite. And you can see the tooth marks and stuff. Because when you put these animals on exhibit, you can tell the story of the hardships for the animals and the story that you had to offer on your experience being in the environment and trying to collect these animals to make this exhibit, to bring it out as dynamic as possible. I think that that's the right mindset for for sure when it comes to sort of zoological exhibits. It it really, I I don't like it when I see just exhibits that are kind of a lot of turtles packed in and there's really nothing more than just a little basic placard that tells you what species are in there. Really, when it, you get down and and sort of understand what went into getting those animals, why they're there, why they're important, that's kind of what what matters. And when the obviously the exhibit is is. Uh, is appealing in its own right is, is good. Uh, so 
that it was interesting to hear too that you're saying you're noticing a lot of variations and, and such. The uh, I think the Kimberly Longneck, um, you played sort of a role in in maybe detecting that, or what, what was sort of your role in the description of the Kimberly Longneck, and maybe what the history of that, the the type specimen, the type series is kind of interesting. Maybe you could provide some background on that. So John. John Ken mentioned the, a long neck that occurred in the Kimberley. And um, I applied for a permit, but the people in Western Australia, the Department of Wildlife, didn't have a name for this turtle. It wasn't a rugosa. And since they didn't have a name, they, they couldn't really um, tell, make a decision on what to do. So I did get a permit for um, rugosa which is Chelodina at the time was Chelodina rugosa. And we went out to the location that John had described where he found this long neck or which people had told him that this long neck was very different. And uh, with Dion, myself and Jakova, we went out there and we started searching. We spent a couple of days searching this river and on the Victoria River, way up the Victoria River, we found this first one. And so once we got into the habitat and we knew where they were, we collected um, the 10 turtles. I had a permit for 10. I collected the 10 turtles and then we brought them back. The unique thing about, the, the, the strange thing about the collection and the bringing back of these turtles was you had to take your turtles and your permit to the Department of Wildlife at the border between Western Australia and Northern Territory and declare the animals. And when I declared them, the game, the, the game warden guy was saying, well, that's not Rugosa, your permit says Rugosa. I said, well, what is it? What is it? I said, your listing for Western Australia does not have a rugosa, but it doesn't have any other long neck. So if it doesn't have a long neck and this is not rugosa, then it doesn't exist. You either accept rugosa or you don't accept it at all. So he said, well, it's probably something different. I said, well, what we are going to do is we're going to try to describe this and determine it through DNA sampling and stuff. But whatever we do, we're going to let you guys know. We're going to send you a copy. We're going to, you know, um, list you guys in it. So, so we brought those 10 animals back. And one, one animal died and we took that animal um, and we sent it to the um, American Museum of Natural History. And uh, Bill McCord got interested in it, came down and see all the turtles. We had the live ones. And strange enough, uh, within two months of getting them into the United States, uh, we, had, we had mating and then the bread. Um, so we sent that one up to uh, the American Museum of Natural History. Um, I can't remember the guy name who was working on the taxonomy, but him and Bill McCord, they were the ones who were able to examine it and uh, determine that it's a new species. And they call it willow urina, which is the bearded turtle. That's interesting that it made its way to the United States. A lot of the species descriptions by John Can and uh, other authors over time it seems like it's been sort of restricted to australia but that's that's yeah. a pretty interesting kind of story about how yeah you, you actually had to clear them at the border but it doesn't exist and it's a, sort of a, a little bit of a, a technical yeah loop. at that time at that time it wasn't a recognized species it was just that there is a long neck turtle there and we don't know what it is and very few people had actually seen it uh, and um you know we were one of the first people to collect it have it brought it out and then be able to really get one in the hands of scientists who were capable of using it as a holotype to determine the, the species genuinely. Right. That's really interesting. And when it, when it comes to sort of some of your other adventures there, there's a lot of, there's actually a surprise, even now, right, the description of the uh, uh, Caledina Caritral Pongo kind of highlights there's a lot of variation within northern Australia that's still sort of overlooked. Did you notice any other sort of interesting morphologies of different species there that maybe even haven't been sort of followed up on or? Well, yeah, there, there, there's just quite a lot. For example, we were collecting um, oblongas and which was at the time Chalodina oblonga. Um, and we collected animals and we were looking at shapes of turtles. We had few turtles that we call them the bread box turtles simply because they were not the pear shape. They were elongated, but they were colored. They were square at both ends, and they looked sort of uh, rectangle in shape. Uh, 
And then we got a lot of the Amidura species where you got those that were young, uh, semi, you know, semi-adults, and they were like a regular turtle, bright, nice colored and stuff. And then you get the adults, which were big, goofy headed, big, massive, me megacephalic heads. And you're like, wait a minute, is this the same thing? Is it different? And you look at the science uh, of the turtles and the descriptions, and you had all these different uh, groupings and complexes. You had the Elsea, the, the, the snapping turtles. And then you had snapping turtle from the Victoria River and snapping turtle from the Daly River. One has a black face and one has white patches on the face that would tempt you to immediately think, oh, I got two different turtles. Or you got the Amidura and the Victoria at the time and the Australis at the time were interbeing chains. Sometimes they were one, sometimes they were split. And then you had Emidura, uh, Tani Baraga with white face and Tani Baraga with yellow faces. Um, it was just so, so different working in Australia and trying to determine what you have based on the present day science, the science at the time when you were working. So when we worked out there, things were simple. Everything had a different name. Now everything has switched. Now you have the Macrochelodina complex. You have the Elsea complex. You have the Oblonga complex. Now things have just changed around for you. You just got to keep up with the science to know what's going on in Australia because um, turtles in Australia are unique based on their location, geographic location, simply because they're in these big gorges and they have no connection to other rivers and no connection to other land masses because of the cliffs and the escarpments that boundary them and keep them within their areas. Right, yeah, some of the, the, the sort of physiography around in, in those areas is pretty interesting and, and obviously sort of creates sort of uh, ways of vicariance for the turtles and, and mm -hmm. isolates them. But you're talking about the, the Emidura, the Victoria, the red-faced turtles, that's pretty interesting. So you were seeing megacephalic, it's certain individuals be megacephalic alongside sort of normocephalic individuals. Like, was there a pattern to certain drainage? Yeah, we, we noticed that once they become older animals, they become megacephalic, big, what we call big, goofy headed turtles. And when we collected them and kept them in the containers for transport back to the zoo, uh, we, we went out on three and four day sorties. So you had them for three or four days. They were mainly eating um, mussels and clams. So hence that crushing of those clams, you've got those big crushing plates in the jaw and that in enlarges and increases the muscle size on the, the, the head, which give them the megacephalic look. So, so it's a little bit of, um, you know, based on feeding resources that changes that morpho the morphological look for these animals. Yeah, you, you see the same thing over uh, all around the world with various different species, like even over here with uh, map turtles and musk turtles and snapping turtles. It, it's mo it seems like mostly diet related. Like there's yeah. got to be some sort of genetic basis for that of like ability. But it, like if they're not feeding on something that is that will emulate that growth, they're not going to develop a boof head. I like that term. We don't really use that over here, really. Well, you know, the Australian and the slangs, they got they got pet names or, uh, for everything. And everybody refer you, you know, if you say megacephalic, unless the person is into the science of turtles, they would know. But if you say a boofy head, oh, everybody know a boofy head turtle. <laughs> everybody <laughs> can tell you about a boofy <laughs> head turtle. Yeah, it was kind of similar to, uh, in John Can's book, the uh, he mentioned like the the males of the the Victoria. Maybe it was in reference to Australis at the time, although I think they've been sort of synonymized. But yeah, he said the males would get these, like you said, large heads and the feet and or that yeah, the, the it was sort of reverse, I guess. The males get the large heads and the females stay a little bit more narrow. The map turtles here, it's the opposite. Females get mm -hmm. really massive, crushing surfaces, and and males stay really small. So kind of an interesting. I guess dichotomy there. Um, yeah, that's that's I mean just fascinating to do the work. What is it like? The Kimberley region is really kind of a fascinating place. Not a lot of people know about. But w what is it like to to be there? What is the environment like? And and are you working with sort of the Aboriginal people there or, uh, to get information, or how do you kind of know how to navigate that, that ecosystem? Well, 
Northern Territory, we had to work through the Aboriginal uh, peoples. It's opposite to what you have here in the United States. The federal government of the United States are the overarching authority. And then you have the state government. And after the state government, um, really, it's if you wanted to go on somebody's property, you have to ask them permission. It's directly the opposite in Australia. The Aboriginal people are the overarching authority. The wildlife and the property, the rivers belong to the Aboriginal people. You have to get their permission. Then you have to get the, fed the state permission. Then you get the federal permission. So it's totally opposite. So we had to work through um, several mm -hmm. Aboriginal corporations, which is little corporations set up by the Aboriginal people to manage their land. So you had a land use uh, committee of the Aborigines, and then you had um, the corporation that give permission for people to collect animals off their property. So we okay. did work through the, it was called the uh, Abor uh, Aboriginal Baranganji Corporation, ABC Corporation in Northern Territory. In Western Australia, we didn't do that. That was not the law in Western Australia. We dealt with the um, uh, state government and we went on to public lands, state lands on the Victoria River to collect the willow urina and the australis. Okay, interesting. So that was sort but of the, the environment. The, the the entire northern and western Australia is made up of these big sandstone complex, semi-arid region where you have massive escarpments, deep, wide rivers, which have um, it, it, it's a perennial uh, river, but you have these massive um, uh, uh, seasonal flows, which creates islands in the middle of these rivers. And during the dry season, that's what uh, the turtles come up, where the crocodiles come up. A lot of them come up there for nesting and stuff. Because if you go to the edges of the river, um, it's all steep-sided. And you really, you know, turtles can climb up. There's not much nesting. So they depend a lot on these sandbanks and um, uh, little islands that you meet in the middle of these rivers. And the, uh, did most of the fly river turtles or the Coretta Kellys come from the Daly River? The yes, Daly River. Yeah, that's where they come from. There's, you know, you have to go way up the Daly River and uh, that's where you find them. And uh, when we went in there in June of 2004, we were fortunate to see um, several uh, nests of credit chilies. We saw one or two um, live ones, but we weren't after credit chilies uh, because we got those in the pet trade here in the United States and from illegal seizures from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay, well, so, and I've actually never been to the National Aquarium. I definitely need to get there. But how many species did you, of Australian, I guess, more northern Australian turtles did you end up getting? Like, we, brought, we brought in 19 species. There were 37 species or so in Australia. And I think we got in 19 of, of, of them. Oh, wow. Okay, so there's a good deal. of Yeah, we, we had a very diverse collection. And... Um, uh, we depicted the animals based on the the region, the, the, the location on the river that you would find them and the fish species that they live with. So like a lot of the emiduras were down the river with the rainbow fish and all of that. And all the big long necks were on the upper part of the river river with the big schooling catfish and barramundis and things. So, so the exhibit was a big... Uh, was a river in the Northern Territory in the um, uh, land, uh, escarpment region, but you were actually down at the bottom of the river looking underwater. So that's what we did. And we had the big pools with the big waterfalls, then the, the slow moving water, and then the big trickles down where the grasses and stuff were growing because the water is really shallow. And the fish species were, were separated out into those regions with the turtle that match and, and, and was appropriate for that in the life cycle that you would find in Australia, just as you would find it. And we also brought in a lot of plants, endemic plants, to, uh, uh, native plants, indigenous plants to Australia, and we set them up to make the exhibit complete with all the burnt stumps and logs and pandanas and eucalyptus and everything. Everything was authentic as best as we could to represent the region. Yeah, I was, I was, I was amazed the first time I went into the the Australian exhibits at the Baltimore Aquarium. Every, everything was everything was perfect. The scene was set for each animal. Like that's a, makes a world of difference compared to just throwing them in an empty tank with random like koi fish or something. Mm -hmm. Right. That 
So one thing, too, I'm interested in, like you mentioned earlier with your trip to Guyana, you went and learned a lot about sort of the natural history of the animals. I imagine that kind of obviously sort of unavoidable for naturalists, I think, like ourselves. You go out in the wilderness and you start making observations. What kind of things did you learn maybe about some of the species you were looking at, maybe that were unexpected? And, and how did you sort of employ those in the exhibits? Well, coming from a zoo background, everything was sort of, every, every exhibit met the pattern that you see in a zoo. It's nice and clean water, a piece of wood for the animal to sit on or hide behind, a couple of rocks on the bottom, and that was it. It was sort of, I wouldn't say sterile, but sort of stereotypical for every tank. And at the time, um, I had met up with a guy called Ray Mendez, who was a great exhibitor. Ray and I became friends and Ray showed me um, how to, to picture things and how to bring out as much of the naturalistic looking environment for the species uh, into tanks and into exhibits and stuff. And so when I went down to Guyana, that was some of the things I paid attention to. Um, water turbidity, um, the vegetation around, the way the sunlight coming in, was it morning sunlight or was it afternoon sunlight that the animals are uh, receiving? How did they receive that sunlight? How deep was the water, the temperature of the water? Um, was it fast moving or slow moving? Because when I first saw uh, platymes, I didn't recognize it was platymes, platycephala, and the first one went past me. It was like a piece of wood back floating down the river. The animal wasn't swimming. And then when Peter reached down and grabbed it, and he said, oh, here's a platinum. I'm like, yeah, that one just passed me. I didn't realize it was a turtle. And uh -huh. learning to get that eye to see it, and then I started seeing how all these animals fit in and how they, how they use the environment for camouflage and how they, they color all the colors around, help them to blend in and stuff. It gave me a better sense of, how to create exhibits. So I use all that field experience to create better uh, dynamics in the exhibits that I, were, that I was working with. Was it, when you were in Australia, was there any particularly interesting sort of natural history notes that you noted with any of those turtles that you were looking at? Maybe something that... I... Yeah, um, as I mentioned to you, the big log jams, I never would have thought that that was the place where all the turtles were hiding. So one of the things we created, I don't know, the guy who um, went uh, to the National Aquarium in the very first tank with the barramundi, you're going to see a big log jam on the right-hand side. And that was what we created for the turtles to hide and for them to feel comfortable. And it's exactly as you would see it underwater in that we photographed some of these gorges and we photographed the shape of the stone and the, the, the cut and the clefts in the rocks. And we took those photographs and that's what we built when we were building the rock book for that exhibit. So, so yeah, a lot of it helped us, you know, by trying to be as natural, naturalistic as possible. Um, the way the logs were, um, how they lean into the water, the angles at which they come out, how much on it was sunlight uh, was exposed to sunlight and which wasn't. Um, all these things we put together and paid attention to because that is what kept the animals happy and kept them in the area and give them the security they needed to be comfortable. Right, that's that's really sort of, I, I think, a good thing. Um, yeah, yeah, so one of the things too, we were, we were talking to Andrew Rogers and he mentioned that, that uh, that you had a helicopter during one of these surveys? I, I don't know how... No, no, we talked to people, but basically we on our own, uh, in the Northern Territory, there are a lot of these private flights that you can take for tourists. And so okay. if, you, if you, you book the plane, meaning that you had, they were taking six people, if you got six people who had interest in what you were interested in, you can get the pilot to take the route you were wanted and all they were interested in is their time. You know, and as long as you paid for the time, the distance doesn't matter to them because it's data fly they're flying by time and not by distance. So we went to Northern Territory, Dion arranged with a couple of these pilots. We went, you know, a couple of us, four of us went, uh, there was a plane for four and the four of us went and we took these flights and we asked the guy to go up the river as far as he could based on the amount of time he wanted to spend so we can see what the rivers look like and where would be nice spots to go looking for turtles and to see if we can see anything from the air because Dion was also interested in sawfish. So that gave us, you know, we did two of those and they weren't expensive, 
they were like a hundred dollars for the the forty five minutes to run up to you know to make the, the the trip, and so we paid it out of our pocket. Um, so it wasn't hiring anything specifically for that. We kind of nudged the pilot to help us out by hey, here's what we want to do, and they were all interested in what we were doing, and they made the flights to to get us to get the, uh, an opportunity to see those rivers from up in the air. That is that is interesting <laughs> i've been to uh i went to madagascar in 2018 and it, they've got a i don't know if you could convince the pilots but they, they're sort of like once you get into the the country there's sort of like a taxi system with the planes i don't yeah. there it might be a bit tougher to convince a, a you might still have to get a private pilot but it's not really that structured so kind of an interesting i, I mean i guess make it something that's useful right it's kind of a cool yeah ingenuity uh yeah right so and the alsaya too that's another interesting group of turtles the uh, i think flavia ventralis the white uh white-throated snapper was within range of where you're yep. at albagula Albagu uh yeah albagula is really yeah. unique yeah. in that lca group o and i is even more interesting i mean to me my favorite turtle from all of australia is o and i from the Elsea complex and Australis. I love those two, those two turtles. Australia, Australis is so vibrant. And then um, when you look at uh, uh, Owen I, I mean, you can see, you know, there's so much color variation, pink nose, yellow faces, yellow shell. Um, it's the most, it's one of the most beautiful turtles I've ever seen. Yeah, and were those? Did you end up getting access to those for the exhibits, or what, what, did you find those? We, we got those from private collections. We got the okay. we, we caught we caught the Australis out on the Victoria River, but the O and I um, in Queensland we didn't get to, to get to the location for O and I and stuff. So we had to go to the private turtle breeders who had them and acquire those out of the private breeders. Yeah, that makes sense. There's a uh, one of the, one of the probably maybe only schools in the U.S. of a Irwin's snapping turtle in the CRI collection. Kind of an interesting thing, but uh, yeah, very yeah, interesting. Two two unique turtles in in the aquarium here in the United States, and that's the uh, um, Elusa, the the big Elusa, and then you have the uh, Owens turtle. And the National Aquarium is the only one that have Elusa have a um, Owens and the Bronx Zoo just got some baby Elusas, but at the National Aquarium, I had a large, um, very big Elusas which bred, and we had babies of the Elusa in uh, in the National Aquarium. Right, and so the justification for a lot of this was to create sort of right a, a captive arc of species, and and to breed them in captivity. What what sort of so. Uh, I imagine that's what it was. Like, how, yeah. So, how many did you end up breeding, and kind of what are what's the story there? Were there any so species we, that were tough? When or? I was there, we bred everything except the albagula and Dang, the barangangi, wow. the big sandstone long neck. And after I left, apparently, um, I, after I left, the new curator Ken Howell, they have bred the barangangi. So, um, right now. Um, they have bred everything that we brought in. And the reason, one of the reasons why we brought in all these turtles was one, we got the opportunity to bring them in. You're never going to get that opportunity again. So you might as well fill your pockets as best as you could. So we brought in everything that we could get permits for. Secondly, we wanted to start um, a repository for Australian species in the United States that could be used for our exhibit and future exhibits. And thirdly, we wanted to make our exhibit as diverse and as as unique and as authentic as possible. So we needed to have the resources. We needed to have the animal collection to match that authenticity that we wanted. So those were the reasons why we brought what we what what we wanted. And um, once you had them in, the big emphasis was trying to reproduce them. So the first ones to reproduce were Australis and Tani Baraga and Victoria. We bred those readily. And then we started breeding the Elseas and we, start sending animals to different institutions uh, who we had partnership. We had seven institutions we partnered with and we sent animals to all those institutions uh, on loan to hold on to. So there will always be um, animals in the United States uh, to match Australian collections. 
They, why, and why was it the, the uh, white-throated snappers, you said, those haven't bred yet? Is there something maybe we're missing in the natural history? Well, or? yeah, it's probably, it's probably something we're missing, a simple ingredient. And um, that's something that um, the, the, the guys at the aquarium is working on. I know Ken Howell is trying to really work on that to make that. The, that's the last species that they're working on to breed. But, um, yeah, when you do find out, you realize that there's something really, really... Um, small but very important to the species to get them into breeding i didn't spend right. enough time to do that but had i remained at the aquarium that would have been something i would be working on that that's interesting that there's kind of one there it's just that that, that is a little bit different i guess and you got to crack the code uh yeah that that's pretty interesting so one of the things too, have, have you worked with, it's mostly been Australian turtles, but have you done any other, and, and I guess Podoc Nemus, but beyond the, I guess, Keelids uh, or and the, uh, the Pleridires, I guess, and, and maybe yeah. you've done work with others, but have you done work with other turtles or has it mostly focused kind of there? No, that's it. That's the, the species I work with. As I say, I'm an all-rounder, have different interests. And so when when I'm not working with turtles because I don't have turtles in my collection, I'm working with different snakes. I'm, I'm I'm a, a Bushmaster guy. I, I work a lot with Bushmasters. That's still <clears throat> one of my favorite snake species. You know, I do a lot of fish. I work with fish also. And I work with birds. And, um, you know, I have my little favorite and all. So it keeps me busy by having um, interest in all these different taxas. A lot, yeah, a lot of different areas going on. I, I also meant to ask, too, something. How, how do you, like the, the fish and, and turtles, how is that actually, you, you said it takes 52 hours, which is actually pretty impressive that it's that quick, but how do you package all of that? What's the process for that? So, so what you do, your turtles are going to be into wet jute sacks in the pack individually. And uh, you build your box to hold if it's, uh, if you're running with six or eight, and I'll tell you why, why that is so important. When we made the arrangements to ship turtles out of uh, Darwin to Sydney, Sydney to Los Angeles, Los Angeles to Baltimore, um, we, we just got our box size and decided we're going to put turtles and fish and stuff in them and put them in. We never took into consideration that the planes that were carrying these animals had special cargo holes. And one of the things we realized when we got to the airport, that was our, the planes cannot accept a box bigger than 24 inches. So I didn't realize how small the, the window, the, the uh, portholes on those planes were. So we had to redo that. And so we then packed the turtles one, one to a sack, keep it very wet and nail them to the side so that they don't bounce around and stuff. And had somebody in Sydney who would open the box and miss them down, had somebody in LA who would do the same thing and then receive them in Baltimore. Wow. Yeah, so we had to do that for all our animals, even the fish. When we ship in fish, you are shipping water. So I had seven yeah. barramundis that I had to bring to the United States. Each barramundi was about uh, three feet long and each one had to be in 300 liters of water. So the fish weighed about 18 pounds, but the water weighed, you know, nearly, nearly what, nearly a thousand pounds. So we were just paying for water, shipping water from the, from Australia to the United States. So, so a lot of logistics had to go in into planning what you have and how you're going to package it and how you're going to send it out and what's the best way to make sure you reach maximum, you get maximum survival on our end. Because one of the things the, the Australians were looking at was survival rate in that um, they gave us these animals, but if they found out and if we didn't do a good job at shipping and animals started dying in transport, they would have shut us down. So we had to make sure that we had, you know, maximum survival. And quite frankly, we didn't lose anything. I mean, we lost one turtle um, in shipping and it, it, not in shipping, but it died after it arrived in the United States. But pretty much all our fish, all our lizards, everything, we had almost 100% survival. Wow. Thanks. So you mentioned that there was someone there that would receive the cargo and then spray the turtles down. Was that someone from the zoo or was that someone who was just... No, we, we hired people at the um, shipping agency who were into, into animal shipping. So huh. jet, pets, jet Pets in Sydney would receive it when we ship it from Darwin and they would open the box 
and miss everything down and make sure everything was fine, then reclose the box and then run it through customs, take it to the airline, the airline would load it up. And then when we got into LA, we had another um, uh, agency, another fish shipping guy uh, who would do the same thing with the boxes, check on it for us, miss everything down, and then take them to the local terminal and reload them on the plane so they can get to Baltimore. Wow. That's uh, quite the process. Good, though, that th those things were implemented, and I guess that they were monitoring, right? It's easy for people, I think, to just – not that, that you would have been doing this working with a pretty prestigious uh, institution there, but easy kind of to, for, for turtles to uh, perish while in transport. So good that there was sort of that, that uh, system in line, I think. Yeah, we looked at – different people who were shipping we talked to a lot of people what's the best way to ship you know um how do they ship we went to all the iata regulations and everything and then we sort of um use bits and pieces of all of that to meet this, the, the federal requirements but at the same time find out what is best for the animals and to maximize shipping to bring it to the to the us right right that's yeah. cool uh, did you? I was curious too. I was thinking about this, but the the Warrells turtles and the uh, Subglobosa were. Did you actually get to go work in the Jardine River or the small area they're at in Australia? Yeah, no, I didn't go up to the Jardine to look for turtles because Subglobosa, which I wanted, was so common in the pet trade that all I did right. was look for the best ones and. Um, Warrelai, there was no permits being issued through Queensland government for Warrelai simply because um, they were heavy science based at the wildlife department and they were still trying to determine uh, that sub complex and whether Warrelai should be recognized as a genuine species on its own or should be lumped with sub -gubosa. So um, they didn't want to issue a permit for something that they weren't too sure about. So we, we didn't get a permit for Warrelai. Although Warrelai <laughs> looks just like a sub -gubosa, but it's very, very brightly colored. Right, yeah. And I know Jason too, He's in. Uh, he's got some Macquarie turtles, man. But uh, were those? Did you search for those? Those kind of that, that's kind of outside of your sort of range, right? That's yeah, like it's outside. That's way up in, in northern Queensland. But Macquarie, I, I had Macquarie at the aquarium, um, and then I I got rid of the Macquarie because they were all um, from the New Guinea area, and they were all brought into the United States many years ago, and they were very common in the in the U.S. collections. So we moved the Macquarie, and we kept all the authentic Australian species. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that makes, I guess, makes sense in terms of you're kind of stratifying your exhibits. Uh, so one of the other things, too, is you're the executive director of the Zoological Association of America, uh, maybe you could tell us just a little bit about um, sort of what that is and kind of what your responsibilities are there. So ZAA is the second largest trade organization in the zoological sector. The other one is the AZA, American Zoo Association. ZAA, American Zoo Association is about 75 years old. ZAA is only 15 years old. And we are a membership organization that offers accreditation an accreditation program to zoos. Um, we believe that uh, the owners of institutions through responsible ownership can tailor their collections to meet the needs of the animals and therefore produce the best exhibits. And that's what we've been working with. Um, all our members, we have over 600 members. We have about uh, 65 accredited facilities through the United States. Some of our accredited facilities are like Columbus Zoo, Fort Woods Zoo, um, uh, Pittsburgh, Montgomery, um, and we have a lot of the private institutions like uh, Tanganyika Wildlife Park, African Wildlife Safari, um, and some of the breeding facilities like um, Austin Savannah. And ZAA is based on um, number of employees in the facility we have small medium large and macro and it's all about how many full-time employees working to 32 hours and more uh is at your facility it's not based on any operating budget or anything like that and our most expensive um accredited accredited facility uh cost is uh forty five hundred dollars as opposed to you know the the 
tens of thousands of dollars with other facilities and other organizations. Right. That, that's a cool uh, sort of sort of a different. Is there any does it have I know the private sector and private breeders a lot of times try to get involved with the. Is there any difference between kind of how private individuals can get involved with with. I, I don't know. I guess the AZA has got the SSPs and such. Is that something ZAA does or how, how is that? Yeah, we have, we have a similar program. It's called animal managed programs. And um, if you are a private facility, you own your animals, your animals are registered in the AMP. Um, you can move your animal from one facility to another. The animal remains in the program. We ask you, we don't demand from you and we don't tell you what to do, but we ask you to keep the animal in the program. And if if you are transferring your animal to another facility, if you would encourage that facility to maintain that that animal stays in the program. So so we do have AMPs for different species um, and uh, we, are, we are encouraging, we have more. Each of our AMP has to have a champion, has to have... Um, at least five institutions participate in it, at least 20 animals registered into that program. Those are some of the basic requirements to be an AMP. And AMPs are only managed and operated by professional fellow members of ZAA. All right, that's that's cool, cool to know. I, yeah, I've, I've heard, I mean, yeah, I haven't heard as much about, I, I didn't, didn't know as much about ZAA, so it's good to sort of hear. Uh, and then maybe too, we could even, uh, you've done some work with bats and, and I, in a lot of different countries with, with a variety of different animals. Uh, have, may, have you come across any turtles just sort of, I guess, on, by chance or ha any, any interesting encounters with, with turtles while doing other work? Sort of? Yeah. So in, in, um, Working in Papua New Guinea, when I was working with bats, I did go down to the Gogol River and the Sepik River to look at um, uh, nesting sites for pignose turtle. I was interested in pignose turtle simply because it was a unique species, one of the few freshwater turtles that had flippers. And also I was interested in um, crocodiles and the Sepik River and Gogol River were the two rivers in New Guinea, which had some of the highest incidents of crocodile attacks. So I just wanted to see what it was like, the people, how the interaction went on, why were the people, why would the attacks were so great, and what sort of um, uh, interaction went on with people's life and culture to bring them into the environment with the crocodile when they know fully well that these rivers are infested with crocodiles. So, um, as I say, the one species that I, I looked at was um, uh, the fly river turtle in Papua New Guinea. Um, working down in, in Trinidad, um, being out in the bush, I, I did a lot of the um, frying ups. We have frying ups in Trinidad, kind of sternum, uh, rhino clemmies, and um, the two, uh, we have the denticulata, the yellow foot, and the red foot denticulata and carbonaria in Trinidad. So I worked with those while I was working with bats in Trinidad. Because for seven years, I worked with David Attenborough doing his films, uh, The Trials of Life. And uh, while working on The Trials of Life, um, I had to do a lot of uh, uh, bush work for them. Um, you know, I started off as a recce, but then became a, a, a research assistant for him. But um, going out and looking at the animals and looking at the, the environment and setting up shots and look and things like that put me into areas where I was able to see a lot of the, all of these turtles. And that information helped me to bring these animals to Peter Pritchard. You know, when he was doing his book, he he wanted it quick and dirty. I am coming on to Trinidad for two days. Can we see habitat and animals like frynops? in their natural environment. So yes, I was no able to, yes, let's go. I knew exactly where it was and could take him there. In a matter of hours, we were in and we were out. And then he was able to go down to either Venezuela or Guyana or Suriname to continue his trips and stuff. So, so I did spend a little bit of time looking at what was around me, regardless of what my topic of interest was at the time. That's cool. That That's cr uh, really interesting. You work with the David Attenborough crew. I've heard that they do compared to some other groups that they really come in and will will wait for a shot for an incredible amount of time did you experience that like were you watching them film or were you just kind of yeah i work roger jackman was our photographer and um um nick upton 
was our biologist. And yeah, you want to get that authentic shot, but sometimes you don't get it and you have to fake it. And, you know, um, but they try as much as possible for authenticity to support the narrative of David Attenborough's programs. So, yeah, most of it, 99% of it is all in the natural area and looking at the species and getting the right behavior. Because remember, a lot of his thing is bringing behavior, bringing behavior to, um, to the general population simply because people know the animal, they've seen the animal, but they don't know what the animal actually does in, the, in, in, in its natural environment. Right. Yeah, he's got some really interesting. I'd love to see a turtle, David Attenborough turtle special, I think just in the in interest of our, our, our sort of specific interest. But yeah, there's a lot of really interesting things. But, that... You know, I, I guess doing a documentary on turtle today will be far different than doing one in the time when I worked with all these turtles, you know, 15, 20 years ago and back. Because now with um, Dick Voigt's discovery of uh, communication and all of that, you know, on product, you'd want to, you'd want to include all of that, all that new science, you know, um, it, 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 it's going to be really interesting to see as, as we move forward and science and technology develop, what we're going to know about these little creatures that just walked around silently. At the time we thought, you know, turtle was a silent population, except when it's breeding time, you hear them gawking and making noise. But um, I'm sure there's much more to turtles than we really give them credit for. Right. I mean, I, I think that that's honestly, we're starting to come up on time here. That's honestly, I think maybe a good place to sort of wrap up. But we do, so we do something at the end of the show with everyone. I forgot to mention this in, in preparation but we do like a little turtle trivia around just kind of for fun and listeners seem to like it. So I don't know if uh, John, if you have any like turtle random kind of obscure turtle facts that you want to throw our yeah, way. Of course I have you. one. It's like, uh, why, why do Australian turtles stay underwater longer than turtles from the rest of the world? Oh yeah. Well, this is a, th this is a good question. I don't know. Someone want to, who wants to answer this? <laughs> Go ahead. I think a I, lot of them, like it's cloacal respiration in a lot of them. Like, yep, it's cloacal respiration and it's a defense mechanism. If you can stay on the water longer, you can get out of the way and you can also um, elude predators because predators wait for you to break the surface. And once you break the surface, they see you and they come after you, crocodiles and stuff. So um, the Australian turtles have developed cloacal respiration which helps them stay on the water a lot longer. Um, and they can feed for longer periods, therefore breaking the surface um, less often and so evade predators. Well, actually too, that, that brings up an interesting question. Uh, as someone that was working kind of in the captive environment, how long have you seen one stay underwater? That's sort of one of those debated questions. How long can turtles did you ever clock one and see how long it had? No, we never did. But, um, you know, that was that's strange enough that you mentioned that. When I left the aquarium, we had just started looking at those things. And one of the things we looked at was crocodiles. Everybody said, you know, crocodiles can stay underwater for 35 35 to 40 minutes. And that's what we went out with. And that was the narrative that we passed on to the general public that the crocodiles can stay underwater for, you know, 35 to 40 minutes. But one day we clocked a crocodile that stayed underwater for eight hours without coming up for air. And before I went home, I had to nudge that crocodile to get it out of water to make sure when I left work, the crocodile was friggin' alive. <laughs> I had to make sure that I was so you know, how to put it, so much anxiety that if I left that animal and left somebody to look at it and eventually they found out the crocodile was actually dead, I would have been <laughs> in so much trouble. So I made sure. And when we nudged that crocodile with a, with a stick and poke it, it came up. And then we realized crocodiles can stay underwater for that length of time, which gives us a false sense of number of crocodiles when you're doing uh, field surveys. Because if freshies 
can stay underwater for that length of time and you go out on a boat with binoculars and you sit and you look around and when they come up and they break the surface you are probably just capturing half the amount of crocodiles that are in the area the rest are just sitting underwater and they're going to out 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 out, out, out um out time you while you're out there right there's even we were out doing western pond turtle surveys not that they're staying under for i mean who, who knows honestly i don't know anyone that's clocked a western pond turtle but it's like you can go out there and walk around and you're lucky if you see one but if you pull one up it's like jack was snorkeling for half an hour and found one it's like eh, there might be a few in here and then we went out and put traps in there and pulled up 16 in this small yeah. little section of river so it's just it's I yeah mean, that's it's more those little things those little things that make the 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 study interesting is like <clears throat> You got all these little quirks that animals do <clears throat> that you didn't anticipate before. Right, right. And I, I bet sort of in the zoo, you get to see a lot of that if you really pay attention, even in captive environments that are done well. I, I guess one last thing, too. I, I've noticed a lot of times the Keladina will do this kind of guler throat pumping action. I don't know if you've noticed that in other species. Has anything been done to your knowledge looking at what that could be? No, you know, nobody, I, I haven't read anything where anybody look at that. It's a behavior of, of aggression. They usually pump that throat out and they stretch their necks out when they're going after another one. Um, so I, I, I've seen it in aggression. I don't know if it's something that they use as communication during mating or whatever else. But I do know that I have seen that and that is usually associated with aggression. Interesting. Yeah, no, it's, I, I've wondered too, like talking about vocalizations in turtles, if maybe they're creating some sort of sound or just passing over, maybe pushing in water and sort of chemosensory. It, it, there's a lot there, right? Maybe it's doing yeah. a multitude of things. But. Well, I think in, in the near future, uh, communication <clears throat> on acoustics and turtles will be a big study. Um, a lot of people will now look at all these little behaviors we've been seeing and now determine what does it really mean? Um, is it part of the communication to how much sounds they make underwater? We think turtles are underwater and they don't make any noises, but now we know that they do make noises. So it's now a matter of um, uh, taping those noises and trying to interpret, it, interpret them. Right, right. Yeah, it's, yeah. that's uh, definitely a big area for research and uh, kind of an exciting field to follow, I guess. Uh, well, I mean, I think that uh, we've covered some really interesting things and it's been really sort of incredible hearing about a lot of your stories. Uh, and, and again, thank you for coming on. I think we'll, we can start to wrap things up unless there's anything, last words you want to get in before we kind of sign off here uh, for anyone. But yeah, well, so you can... I just I have like a, a question. It's not not really a trivia question, just my own uh, my own question. Like with the Alsea, um, the snapping turtles in Australia, do they also like snap their necks the same way the uh, the American snapping turtles do? No, I think they're called snapping turtles uh, simply because of their biting ability, the big big jaws. Right. Yeah. Um, they you know they have that. They're like the short necks that put their head to the side, but there is no snapping like you do with our, our snapping turtles. I see. Yeah. Cool. So, Michael, one of the things you had on the list that we to, to talk about was what's the future for someone getting into this career? Sure, yeah, let, let's do that. Yeah, I just and, and you know, I don't want to be a naysayer or a doomsday guy, but I, I, I really um, have fear that the future of people having collections to work with is coming, becoming shorter and shorter. Uh, gone are the days when you could go out into the field and collect animals and bring animals into captivity and stuff. Uh, we have seen it happen to all the charismatic mammals. We have seen it happen into birds. And in a very short while, you're going to see it happening to reptiles. Um, they've already gone after the snakes and stuff. Even though you can't, you, you know, you may not be able to collect them, you can't bring them into certain states and stuff. And I think the windows for uh, people in the future, young people coming to have a career in animals and work with animals and work with these diverse collections is becoming shorter and shorter. I, I, I don't know and I have very little information to offer as to where we're going to go. You know, what's going to happen? Right, right. I think that... Uh... You know, we talk a lot about how 
you get a lot when you look at even the Pritchard collection, that's not live animals, but you wonder sometimes how did he get a lot of this stuff back? And I mean, prior to 2001, I think maybe a lot of that was sort of easier, but then yeah, nowadays too, right? The conservation side of things, just it's a new with the internet and how interconnected we are. It's just a new level of pressure on, on wild populations. And it makes a lot of things, I, I think, I don't know, regulations a lot of times seem like maybe it's beneficial, but then sometimes it gets in the way of work that's trying to create these invisible arcs for species. And, and uh, it, it can be sort of a, a challenge to overcome when you have a sort of, you're looking to, to do something positive versus just using an animal, uh, which is what a lot of this, I, when we were in, in Madagascar with the radiated tortoises, this is for that confiscation of 11,000. It's just you realize, right, they can't get any of those tortoises out of the country just because Madagascar doesn't want to have anything to do with that. And, and, and I guess that's their prerogative. But then you think about, OK, these things are just going to get repoached. It's only sort of a matter of time before uh, they, they sort of run out. So I, I don't know. I, I can't. It's tough. It's a tough situation, and it comes from a lot of angles. And I think that that local countries should have a lot of say, right, and and sort of what happens there. But at the same rate, sometimes the the competing interests, so the poachers and and, and captive breeders, a lot of times, or, or people trying to create these invisible arcs, kind of have the same. They want the same thing for different reasons, right? They for want different the reasons, animals. yeah. Yeah, right, I so. think there will always be um, room for research and conservation, people going out in the field, but trying to to build that stewardship and that love and that passion, you will not have captive collections where people can actually go and get started and say, you know what, I really love this, to be able to get to go to school and then branch out into the field of research and conservation. So I think safeguarding what we have right now and using it wisely to generate Public, to generate public interest, to build stewardship and develop that passion is what we should be doing. So um, things like TSA and all these big turtle collections, I think they should have a component to really work with the public into teaching them and building that stewardship and showing them the importance um, and the need for conservation and also the need for having these animals in captivity to work with them. Having some of these animals in captivity is so important. Like you can look back at many different species you could never collect today that yeah. they're, they're not in, there's, we don't really have any in captivity and we just probably never will. And it's, it just is like whenever, when the opportunity is there to build an actual, as you'd say, arc of like species, you got to jump on it like pretty much because yeah. mm -hmm. it, it's just waning over time now. Yeah. And hitting home on sort of the educational value, that's something that we did take for granted, right? If you can inspire a thousand children just by looking through a well-done exhibit to think like, wow, this is actually something that exists and maybe I can make this my career, that that's making an impact. So, yeah, uh, yeah I think that that's – out doing these pond turtle things, they had a sort of a – I guess someone donated a lot of money to Turtle Conservancy to – bring out a bunch of children from uh, different schools to do a turtle camp for a week. And we got to show them the, the pond turtles and everything. And they were really kind of heavily invested as middle schoolers. And it's just really cool to see that kind of thing. And, and to get to do it in the field is one thing, but yeah, it's that, that's a rare experience, but yeah, zoo and, and sort of the capacity it has to, to contribute. I mean, we've talked to a lot of people already on the show and, and, there have been, I think, kind of a common theme of like, I used to find turtles or I used to go to this zoo and, and see turtles and it really kind of inspired me. So, yeah, that's that's a good point, too. The educational value is something I think yeah. is pretty valuable. Yeah, we got to make turtles the showpiece, because if you look beside the National Aquarium, um, a lot of places that have turtles, they're happenstance. It's just a, it's an exhibit filler. They throw two turtles in there and, you know, just to fill the exhibit. But turtles are not the main focus. It's not the style of the exhibit. And um, we need to we need to change that. Yeah, that's that is a good thing. Well, I, unless if anyone wants to anyone has last minute thoughts, then we can then. Uh, but I think that we can. Yeah, we can start wrapping things up. But uh, again, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. It's good to talk yeah. to you guys. 
Yeah, it was really, I think, a really interesting conversation, and 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 thank you for coming on. But so yeah, for folks uh, that you want to learn more about the ColoniaCast podcast, you can find us at the turtleroom.org slash ColoniaCast. We've also got our student research fund up there. Uh, if you feel like contributing for all of our listeners, uh, just a reminder, uh, you can find us on our social media platforms at the ColoniaCast, and we will see you next time. So goodbye. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. coming on. It was great talking to you. Great talking.